Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you. Toda la el. Thanks be to the Lord God of Israel. Father, in the last few minutes of the service, just come pour your spirit out upon every heart and your word. Let the vessel be out of the way that your word could come forth in righteousness and in truth and, and change our hearts. God, change us. Every time we hear that word, every time we read that word, every time we get into your word, change us, turn us, and we shall be turned. You must increase, we must decrease. Let it be so today, Bashem Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. What a blessing. What a blessing. If you have your copy of the scriptures, would you hold them up? Hafochba, hafochba, dekolaba. Hafochba, hafochba, mashiachba. Turn it and turn it. Everything you need is in it. Turn it and turn it. For the Messiah is in it. Oh, I'm glad God gave me that. <laughs> well, didn't he give me that through Michael? I mean, you have no idea how many times that's happened in my house. You have no idea how many times I've gone home on Shabbat feeling so good after a message. And my wife says, where did you get that point about? And I said, well, the spirit of God gave it to me. And she said, I just told you that last week. I say, well, that's how I got it from God. So anyway, listen, I was going to read in the parasha uh, just past in, in chapter 34, what Michael read in 33, he, he ended up chapter 33, but he did such a good job. And, and when I got to listening to him and paying attention to what he was saying, I'm like, well, that's more of what I wanted to say than the 34. 34 was where it draws the boundaries for Israel. God says, this is your northern boundary, your southern boundary, your eastern, your western boundary. So he draws all the boundaries for the land. But, but in what Michael read, this is very important, people. Listen to me. He gives them the land. Everybody say, he gives them the land. Now look. Isaiah said, come, let us reason together. Let's reason together here for just a minute. Think with me. He gave them the land. Why in the world would they have to fight for it? Now, is God big enough to just somehow miraculously go to the people that were in the land, the Canaanites, who were just living hedonistic lives? Was he big enough to just go and say, get off the land, I'm giving it to the Jewish people? The Hebrew people. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. He could have sent a prophet. He could have. Is he able to do anything he wills to do? He could have just dropped them all dead. He could have moved them south. He could have, but he, he, instead he left them in the land and he let Israel fight for the land. It was a gift. He gave them the land. I'm giving you the land. We read about it earlier in Numbers and how some believed and some didn't. He gave them the land. But he made them fight for it. Look, I'm going to speak in some generalities at first this morning. So don't, don't get upset if you rent a house. How many of you rent a house or an apartment? It's okay. How many of you have, are buying the place in which you live? Look, I'm speaking in generalities. So I'm not offending anybody. But generally speaking... Homeowners take better care of property than renters do. Don't anybody get upset. It's so quiet. I'm just stating a principle. Most of the time, when you, when you have some skin in the game, when, when you put money, you invested money in this property, and it belongs to you, and it's in your name, it's very important to you. There's, there, it produces in you a sense of responsibility. Somebody's got to maintain that place. When it doesn't belong to you, unless you've been taught by your parents, unless it's been drilled into you, unless you have learned the golden rule, 
you treat others just like you want to be treated. If you live in somebody else's property, you treat that property like it's your own. Unless you've learned that principle and been taught that principle in life, you don't take care of something you rent as much as you take care of something that you own. Ownership is from God. It's good. How many of you know that? Ownership. God said, I'm giving you the land. Israel, you're going to own the land. It's going to be your land. And, and, you know, listen, somebody told me and I believe Mike O'Brien years ago, uh, Rabbi Ron wasn't even here yet. They told us, look, you've got to give people ownership in the congregation. And, and so a lot of people own different parts of this congregation. Now, don't anybody get upset, but, but Gina Winslow owns the sisterhood. Now, she's got some ladies that own it with her. They own that. The God's called them to that. Sam and Rosemary own that kitchen in there. And they've got Ron and Caroline and others that come in and help them, but they own part of that kitchen. They own part of this ministry. The, the Warmans and the Busettis and the Friaries, they own the marriage ministry. They have people that are helping. People own in a, in a good sense. Sense. It's good. Ownership is from God. It, it gives you a higher sense of, of responsibility. This has got your name. You're responsible for this area. But listen to me. If you want to walk with Mashiach, how many of you want to walk with Mashiach? If you're going to walk with Mashiach and learn to know his Father well, you're going at some point, you're going to have to transition from ownership to stewardship. Because in truth, you own nothing. And the longer you walk with the Messiah, the more you realize you don't own anything. He owns you. As Shaul, that's why Shaul of Tarsus was, he was comfortable calling himself a Bond servant. Lord, you bought me. I'm yours. Just tell me what to do. I don't own anything. I don't own this ministry. I don't own anything. I'm yours. At some point, you have to transition from ownership to stewardship. And, and listen to me. I'm, I'm really staying pretty calm to be as pumped up as I am about this. There's only one tunnel way. There's only one passageway from ownership to stewardship. And you know what it is? It's through humility. It's through humbling yourself. It's through godly sorrow that works repentance in your life that changes you. We, we see that in Corinthians. Shaul writes it. For godly sorrow works repentance unto salvation, not to be regretted. Look. I just want to read a portion. I want you to follow along with me. We're going to put it up on the screen. It's out of Acts. I think we're going to start near the end of chapter 7. And we're going to go um, into 8 at that point too. So down in chapter 7, I believe we're going to start at 54. And he's just, the, the Lord has just reprimanded some of the Jewish leaders for what they did with Yeshua. And it says, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, and this is, this is talking about Stephen being martyred for Mashiach. It says, they gnashed at him with their teeth, but he being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and the Messiah Yeshua standing at the right hand of God and said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, Shaul. Everybody say Shaul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Yeshua, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with their sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Shaul's watching all this. And it says in chapter 8, 
Now Shaul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution rose against the congregation which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Shaul, he made havoc of the congregation, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preach Messiah to them. And so we're going to stop there. We're going to go to chapter 9 now. Then Shaul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of Adonai, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And Adonai said, I am Yeshua, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Shaul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus and he was there three days without sight and he neither ate nor drank everybody say three days three days he is there blind blinded by what happened on the road now listen I want you just to think with me what he looked like before that incident he was in charge. It was his life. Now, he thought he was doing ministry for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he was terrorizing believers. And he was powerful in it. And he was dragging people out of homes and throwing them into prison. And he had Stephen stoned at his feet, murdered. And had no regrets about it until God humbled him. And people, maybe, maybe we should all sit for three days with something over our eyes and not look, not be able to see anything, and not eat or drink. Just sitting there three days. What do you think went on in three days with Shaul sitting there? Not talking to anybody, just, just sitting there blind, speechless. I can tell you one thing that went on. There was some deep repentance. How can this be, Yeshua? I was tearing your followers apart, Yeshua. How can this be? God of my fathers, forgive me. I just didn't know. Three days. Three days bound up with this thought. of You know, sometimes don't you wonder about why don't we see more godly sorrow that works repentance unto salvation? It seems like we try to get people to make this mental ascent that Yeshua is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He died for your sins. But, but there doesn't seem to be sometimes in some people that are believers there doesn't seem to be much godly sorrow in them that work much repentance and there's not much humility and and when you have that there's not a transfer from ownership to stewardship you don't ever you these people they seem to own things they seem to want to run things i've seen congregations run by by these people that they run things in the world and they run things in the kingdom you don't run things in the kingdom. That's not the way you do. You just stay in touch and hold on to the captain of your salvation and you learn this is not mine. Like David did with his Shaul, his king Saul. And, and, and had him, he could have killed him and taken the kingdom over David could have, but he, he, he cut just a corner of his robe off and that 
convicted him so much in his heart. He was like, I shouldn't have lifted my hand against the anointed of God. People, listen, godly sorrow working repentance unto salvation from ownership to stewardship. I want to encourage you this morning. We, we, how many of you own your homes again? How many of you love to get into your home? You love to go home to your home when work is over. Your wife, your kids, if I'm talking to guys or, or wives, if they're out and they, they get, I'll tell you, home should be the safest haven on the earth. It should be a refuge for a man to come home to. It should be a refuge for a woman. It should be refuge for your children. Beth Messiah should be a home. For anybody that God calls here, it's good to have a home. I, I want to close with something that happened this week, but just in case there's somebody that just hadn't gotten a heart of a home and what a home should be. You know, I did a funeral this week, a memorial service for Dana Rincon's dad. He passed away in 75 years of age. And, and he came here for about three and a half or four years. And people, listen to me. When I woke up that morning to do the funeral, I didn't know. I went to bed that night. We've just been blowing and going, blowing and going. And I went to bed that night. I, I couldn't even, I just, I, I was so tired. I just, I just went to sleep. I got up early in the morning. God woke me up and, and gave me I'm like, Lord, one of my first thoughts that morning, Lord, what am I supposed to share? And it's like I, I heard the Spirit of God say, homing pigeon. Oh, and I would, you know, you're like, did I eat pizza last night? <laughs> A homing pigeon. And then I, and I was just praying about what, and I thought about this man's life. Danny was his name. Dana's dad was Dan, Danny. And he came here, like I say, for three and a half or four years. And some of you might have met him, known him. Look, he would come here even when his family, when Dana and the family weren't coming, he would make the schlep all the way, I think, from out near Cyprus. He would drive here by himself in his 70s. He wanted to be here. He, he hadn't been to a congregation in a long time. He hadn't established himself in any congregation. But, but what I realized was that God has put something in us just like he put in homing pigeons. You know, homing pigeons, I'm not talking about those ones that on downtown Houston where they poop all over the sidewalk and you have to step around them in their business and watch in the air. And, you know, I'm, I'm talking about from the rock pigeon, the, the, the homing pigeons, where they, they, they are the handiwork of God. They have in them they're going home. They're going home. They're going to get home. You take them. They've taken them a thousand miles away. You, you know, one of our members, Leonid, he raises homing pigeons. And I called him the other day, a couple of days ago, and asked him about it. He told me some phenomenal stories. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. He, he said, brother, they have taken a, he. he he said one of them was over 3,000 miles. They took this pigeon 3,000 miles from his home. And you say, well, why do these pigeons want to get home? Because their home is like our home should be. They want to come home to their mate. They want to come home to their nest. They want to come home and have food with their family. They'll do anything. To, it's in them. It's, it's, it's innate. It's part of the creation. He said it took, I, I don't remember how many weeks and weeks for that homing pigeon, it got home. And I'm like, it's just incredible. And, and, and what I told the people that day was, God's done the same thing in us. He has put a device in us, if you will, a homing device in us. We just want to know our Father. I knew a man that wrote a book, I've got to find my Father. I've got to be at home with my Father. When people get older, if God allows people to get older on the earth, you know what happens near the end of their life, just like Danny? He came here and he found something he had never found before. He found the anointing of God. He, he, he found the presence of God here and he heard the word being taught in truth. And it, it listen, if there's an anointing of God and you're just preaching what's in the word of God and it's true, 
that's a good combination. That, that, that makes older people, they want to hear that. They're, they know they're closer to going home. They want to find home. They, they, God's put it in us. It's in you. It's in me. It's in everyone. Look, you say, well, why don't most people believe in Yeshua if that's the case? I'll tell you why. Because we smother that innate desire in us. We smother it with work and not to defame Danny at all. Danny worked hard. He didn't even get the time with his family he wanted when his girls were young. He worked. How many of us have just worked too hard? We've just, we've smothered up that we want to find our father, but we just smother that with work. We smother it with immorality. We smother it with habits like drugs, tobacco. We just smother. We, there's so many things in the world that you can just smother that innate desire that God put in you to come home and find him. Listen, Beth Messiah, I want to encourage you today. Don't smother any longer what God put in you. The desire to just know him in his fullness. If you're here today and, and, and you're smothering that, you, you, maybe the ownership and stewardship hadn't even made sense to you because you've never trusted your life to, to God through the Messiah Yeshua and that blood atonement. I would encourage you today, come home. Come home to the Father. Once, you, once I'm telling you, once the Ruach of God enters into your life, <laughs> you're home. You'll be home. You, you, you'll, you'll be closer to God than you've ever been, and you'll be longing to see Him face to face. The older He lets you live on the earth, the more you'll get homesick to see Him. Young people here, you think, he, what's he talking about going home for? I'm ready to live my life. Look, let's close with Ecclesiastes. Let's see what he says about the matter, okay? Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened and the clouds do not return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the, sounding, and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low, and they are afraid of height and of terrors in the way, when the almond tree blossoms, the grasshoppers of burden and desire fails, for man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. People, I'm telling you, that is that homing device. The Spirit will return to the God who gave you life. The Spirit that God created you to be is longing to find the Creator, the one who made Him. You're longing to be home with Him. It says a little earlier, serve God when you're young. My wife and I, 48 and a half years of being married together and and serving God when we were young. She served the Lord since she's nine years old. I was a late bloomer, and I came at age 26. But for 43 years, we've been serving the Lord together, walking together in the Lord, laughing together. We're, we're at that place right there. And, and the other night, we were getting ready for bed, and I put my sleep shirt on. And when I did... You know, it says a grasshopper, you get old and a grasshopper can scare the socks off of you. Well, I put my t-shirt on and as I put it on, I didn't notice it, but the tag in the back just stood up and it, and I, and I was, she was cleaning her, her makeup off her face and I was walking in to brush my teeth and when I did, that thing tricked my hair and I thought it was a roach and I pulled 
that shirt off and I was hitting that roach. <laughs> My wife has not laughed like that in a long time. It, it was, listen, people, I'm telling you, if there had been a roach, he would have been a dead one, I promise you. But, but we, we, we do get older. We just want to find our father. I've got to find my father. I found my father 43 years ago when I got hold of his arm that was saying, come on, come on, I'll take you to the father. I'm telling you today, Beth Messiah, let's get hold of Mashiach. He'll take us to the father. Lord, I just pray today for anybody here that doesn't know you, Lord God, this is a day of salvation. This is the accepted time. There are people here, Lord, they're most likely today in both services, there are going to be people who have piled so much on top of that homing device you put in us. We don't, they don't even understand about stewardship that nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to you. We belong to you. We're blood bought by your son, the Mashiach, the Messiah, Yeshua. God, would you just cause men who are, who are women who are here today and who have hidden things in their life, God, we don't want anything to stand between us and our Father. If there's something that we piled on top of that desire to know you and to love you, whether we're young, middle-aged, or old, would you just reveal yourself to us today? In Yeshua's name, thank you. Amen.